<clears throat> How's that? Much better. Okay, good. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we've got a, uh, a pretty long agenda today. Um, just a reminder, we are filming and we do have a webinar going at the same time. So for the speakers, if you would, try to stay at the podium so that the webinar camera can pick you up. Uh, if you move around a lot, we won't get you. Uh, also, we will have two Q&A sessions today. Tom Dunn with the town in emergency management is here uh, to talk to us about hurricane plans. Um, and then uh, we'll stop for a brief moment and have Tom answer any questions that you have. Then we'll get back on our agenda. And of course, at the end of our presentations, which uh, we've got uh, David, uh, Toby, Victoria, and Russell and Amanda, I believe, all uh, doing some presentations. We'll take a five minute break. We'll come back and do Q&A after that. Okay, uh, I'd like to get started. Um, we had a tragic event um, two and a half weeks ago. Property owner Cassandra Klein was attacked and killed by an alligator. We're gonna talk about that this morning a little bit, but for now I'd like to ask you to join me in a moment of silence for Cassandra and her family. Thank you. We continue to express our sympathy and condolences to, to the Klein family. Um, you know, I think we have, did we have uh, uh, the picture of Cassandra up? There is a website uh, or uh, uh, donations made uh, to her at the uh, below, and I know that's kind of hard for you in the back to see, uh, but we'll post this up on the website after we're done uh, for anybody interested in making a donation to, uh, uh, for Cassandra. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got an update to do first. Okay, Pro proposed strategic plan. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, giving us your feedback. We collected comments from uh, property owners on our proposed strategic plan for two weeks from July 11th to the 25th. Uh, those comments were provided to the strategic planning committee as well as to the board and CSA staff directors. Um, the strategic planning committee met on July 27th, and the committee made a recommendation to bring the plan before the CSA board for final approval. Uh, the CSA board is now reviewing the plan and will take a board vote on a plan at the next CSA board meeting. That board meeting is on September 25th at 3 p.m. here in this building. Uh, you can view the proposed plan at www.cpinesliving.com slash strategic plan. So for those of you who are not aware of it or have not seen it, please uh, go there. There's a lot of information there uh, for you to review. A couple videos, or at least two videos, I believe, uh, on it. And uh, yeah, certainly, um, I think the comment collector is closed, but we will have you know open comments at our board meeting on the 25th. Okay. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom Dunn. Tom, thanks. Got to turn it on, don't you? There we go. All right, good morning. How's everybody doing? Uh, just really briefly, i uh, give you a little update on me, who, uh, my background. Uh, firefighter by trade. Um, in 2004, I stepped out of the fire service and slid into uh, the emergency management world. So <clears throat> prior to my time, or post my time as a firefighter with the uh, city of Alexandria, I went to work for the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia as a, uh, I was a state planner, so I did the state plan for the, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, realized I really didn't like state government very much, so I uh, decided the local government's probably the best place for me. Went to work for a planning district commission, and then the, the job here came open, and, uh, and I, came, I came running. Uh, so we're here, we're here to talk about hurricanes, but I want to take a step back really quick and talk about um, how we function and how we operate as a town. Um, I don't know if that'll show up. There you go. So we, we use a, a standard model that you would see anywhere else in the, in, the, in, the, in the wildland fire community in all reality. So we have, or our structure fire for that matter. So we have an incident commander when we open up our emergency operations center here, and, uh, and that's me. So I become our the town's incident commander for any type of event, be it hurricane, snowstorm, 
earthquake, tornado, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> and then we separate the town out in these functional areas. We have operations, which is the entire operation of the town, and obviously a big component of that is fire rescue. Um, we have our planning section, which is huge. Those guys are working around the clock. So we, we develop plans. We have our normal plans, but we're also developing daily plans. So those planning guys are building our plan for the following day today, as well as helping us implement our intended plan for today. Um, logistics is it, it just they get us stuff the stuff that we need they find it for us if we don't already have it and obviously finance is a big component because we have to pay the bills and keep track of all of our time for for FEMA reimbursement and then up at the top is uh, the policy group that consists of the mayor and the uh, at this point the mayor and the town manager um, the our assistant town manager is slated to go to uh, to Buford to their to their operations center to be in that policy group over there to be our liaison to back to the county so it helps it with that connectivity and decision making if for some reason we lose communication with Buford County's EOC so blank screen so let's talk about hazards what I know we're here to talk about hurricanes but let's really quickly talk about some of the other hazards that we face on the island so what are some of the hazards that we face here other than hurricanes, that's the easy one. Tourist. Tourist. <laughs> uh, I'll have to change my slide. Um, <clears throat> I heard. I heard fire. Right. A, a, a wildland fire is potential here in some of the, some of the wooded areas. What else? Earthquakes. That's a big one. So let me. I have a question for you. When was the last earthquake in South Carolina? Hear a date. Pick one, anybody. You get, you get free stuff if you answer. <laughs> Way off. October of eh, you're, you're, you're closer. 2018? 2018. Yes. <clears throat> Can you give me a month? <laughs> Mate, that's close enough. Right, June, June of this year was the, the last earthquake. Uh, it was a little bit below Charleston. It was like a 2.2, so it was a small earthquake. Anybody have a fair guess how many earthquakes we had in 2017? 12. 12's close. Not, not quite. 17, who said 12? That's probably closer. I'll leave us up here. <laughs> Almost knocked somebody out a second ago. So, all right, so we got earthquakes. What other potential hazards do we have? Flooding, yes. Tornadoes, yes. I'll go ahead and pop our, our list up there. So, obviously, tornadoes, water spouts, floods, terrorism is a big one, obviously, with the event that we hold down here every year. Um, one that most people don't talk about around here is tsunamis. We are at risk for tsunami. It's a low probability, high impact event, but we do have the probability for that. And we've been actively planning in partnership with the county for that. And Buford County and the town have just recently been designated tsunami ready. So we have a, we have a plan for, for that. All right, so let's talk, let's talk about hurricanes. I really wanted to really quickly show you 2016. Everybody focuses on Matthew, but if you look at the circle there, we also had Hermine, we also had Con Colin, and then Bonnie, and then um, Julia kind of spun off the coast there. So we had a busy 2016. So I just well, I like to show that Matthew wasn't our only e event. We actually opened up our EOC a couple of times in 2016. So I, I would like to, I like to show the numbers for uh, hurricane season. This is the 2017 numbers from, uh, from Colorado State and, and NOAA, that was their forecast. Um, you can see they're somewhat in range. Uh, Colorado State picks a number, so uh, 11, 4, and 2. And then the actual numbers were 18, 10, and 6. So a little busier season that they anticipated, but still a busy season nonetheless. And really, the, the numbers don't make a whole lot of difference. Um, they're, they're interesting from a discussion standpoint and a science standpoint. Um, I asked a uh, meteorologist who does hurricanes a couple of years ago what how these numbers are, are are developed how they how they do that and he said it's a it's a good combination of darts and science so that was his uh, it was that was his answer to that so that's our numbers for this year as you can see the uh, the numbers in parentheses uh, for Colorado State they downgraded their their assumption for this year uh, just a couple of days ago and uh, NOAA's came out just a couple of days ago and they're pretty much in the same realm they're down to like I think it's nine four and uh, and and two for their for their major hurricane so again the numbers are just interesting. And then there's, oh, there we go, there, there's Noah's numbers that are downgraded for, for, uh, for this hurricane season. So I like to th throw this slide up there because you can see the, uh, the categories of, of storms and, and how the Hurricane Center categorizes those storms. So the one thing that, that is missing there is water. 
Uh, when, when you talk about a hurricane category, it's wind. So who could tell me what Matthew was as it went by us? What category was it? It was actually a two. Yeah, it was actually a two when it went by us. So what were the, con what were the conditions on the island, do you think, during Matthew? It was, it was equivalent to a Cat 1. Um, we were barely, barely a Category 1 sustained winds um, at, at the airport, which is our only, um, only monitoring station. So you can see the damage that caused by Matthew with just Category 1 winds. Um, the second thing is if you look at Irma, Irma was a tropical storm well off of us. We had equivalent tide and equivalent storm surge, and you could see the difference in the two storms. So Irma being very wet and Matthew being very dry. So when you start looking at categories and, oh, you know, I can ride out a one, well, maybe, maybe not, because you don't know what that water is going to be. So pay attention to the water and the storm surge and what they're anticipating that storm surge to be along with the category. There we go. A couple of a uh, couple of changes from the uh, the Hurricane Center that I'll, I'll really talk about, which is this one right here is probably the most important one. Um, they've been running this. It's a uh, a timer for tropical the arrival of tropical storm force winds. What they estimate that arrival time to be, um, and that's a really good decision making tool for us as far as leaving. Um, this tool wasn't available for us during Matthew, but it was was available for Irma and will be now available in the future. Um, they've moved it from a test product, which they had during Irma, to a full on. Uh, a daily product or a normal product that they'll put out on a regular basis. So when you when you click on the the, the some of the news media, you'll 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 begin to see that uh, to see that out there, and that's a really really good tool to help help us make decisions as well as help you make decisions on when and and what time you want to leave. So preparedness. So I'll really quickly talk about preparedness. You know, it's all about you. I mean, it's how you live your life and how you go about your work day to day. So let's talk about an evacuation kit. I'll go ahead and throw my list up there. Pretty simple, you know, water, food, prescriptions, your clothes, your ID, everything that you would normally take on vacation, right? So when you're starting to talk about evacuating and leaving, start just like you would start for a vacation. Think about how you live your life. Uh, a, an interesting story that I, that I tell is I went on vacation with my family, I have two daughters. Uh, we arrived at our hotel, my wife pulls out a large Rubbermaid container. And I'm like, what in the world? So she starts pulling out power strips and cords. And I'm, I'm befuddled at this point. But then I start to realize what she's doing. She's pulling out the power for all the devices we have. I have a work phone, a personal phone. My wife has a phone. My wife has an iPad. My kids have a phone. That's two. They both have an iPad. That's seven devices right there. We still haven't talked about their laptops. So, you know, it's it, prepare for how you live your life, how you go about doing your business. Uh, Information, oh, let me back up right here. Um, in your bags there um, is the town's uh, preparedness guide. It covers all the hazards that we face. Um, and I'll give a, a shout out to PEP, uh, Program for Exceptional People. We partnered with them this year to uh, start stuffing those bags for us. So we take them to stuff the, the, the items, they stuff the bags, and then we go and pick them up. And probably by the end of this month, they'll have already, uh, they'll stuff about 1,000 bags for us. So that's a huge, huge help for us. And it's a, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great opportunity for them. Uh, really quickly, I want to talk about information from the town, how you get your information. Um, we're on Facebook and Twitter. Um, the, uh, during, during Irma, uh, we, we did a whole lot better job on our Facebook than, than we did with Matthew. We felt like we did okay, but we, can, we, we know we need to get better. Uh, one of the things that we have created for social media is we created what we call a VOST. It's a virtual operations support team. <clears throat> so we have about eight folks that evacuate. And their entire job, once they evacuate, is to mine social media for us and mine the Internet. And they get as much information as they can to find stories that aren't correct or maybe a piece of information that we don't have, and they work it back to the EOC. Uh, we didn't have that during Matthew. We deployed it very rudimentary in, uh, in Irma. We'd been discussing it but hadn't really implemented it yet, and that we realized that was a huge help having those five people somewhere else that were safe, that could take their time and mine social media and get that information back to us. So we think moving forward you'll see a whole lot better information coming out of us uh, from Facebook and Twitter and, and other platforms but we'll also be able to address any questions or concerns that are that are beginning or rumors that are beginning to float. Oh, too fast. Um, 
Beaufort County has also got uh, Facebook and Twitter, and um, if you're not signed up for Nixle, that's a pretty good resource for information during Irma. They, they pushed out some really good information, especially photos. They created a nice photo page and you could, or a slideshow that you could go through and see those items. So they did, they did a pretty nice job um, realizing the, the need to make some adjustments post Matthew, and now they've, uh, they've updated their, uh, their social media platform and actually hired somebody. That's all they do to, is to, to manage that social media aspect for them. Our preparedness guide, um, I just put that out there. Um, the, the version you have is brand new, literally just came from the printer. Haven't even had time to update the slide yet, so that's a, a brand new version of what you have there. We have it in English and Spanish available on the town's website. Um, I'll really, really briefly talk about reentry, but patience is key. Um, you guys know that uh, the island is at the end of the road, and you're at the dead end of the road. So, you know, reentry is going to be uh, is, is a challenge. The, the county re redid the reentry plan uh, in coordination with all the uh, all the municipalities. So there is a reentry plan. Perfect. No. Um, do I think it's a pretty good plan for what it does? Yeah, I think it's a whole lot better than what was there. And I think it'll it, it'll work fairly well. But we just ask that, that you be patient on, on the reentry side. Because we don't we don't want that to happen again. You know, listen, listen to information. Um, <clears throat> some incorrect information got out um, post Matthew that was, well, I shouldn't say it was, it was correct, but in, un, un, interpreted incorrectly. Um, the, the governor li did lift the evacuation order for, for Beaufort County, but she returned it to local control. Um, some of the media outlets picked that up and said Beaufort County is open. So pay attention to the source. If you hear it on the news, come back to either the town's website, the county website, you know, the POA website and figure out that that is actually the accurate piece of accurate information. Uh, I'll really quickly, a smart 911 is a program that the county implemented. We have it here as well as in our 911 center. Um, I hate to use the, the, the comparison, but it's almost like creating a Facebook profile. Um, you go in and you create a profile. Uh, you can put as much or as little information as you want. But what happens when you dial 911 is a box pops up on the computer in front of the dispatcher and it has additional information that they may not have. What normally comes up is where you're calling from or some, some coordinates as to where you are and the phone number you're calling from and potentially a name if it's a landline. So they have that piece of information. With this, it'll pop up. It can, it can grab photos. For example, if you have somebody lives in your house that has Alzheimer and they, Alzheimer's and they wander away, you can say, hey, my whoever wandered away, I can't find them. We need to look for them. They can pull up their photo on on the uh, on Smart 911. Um, I don't know about you guys. How many people know your tag number? Yeah, I don't know mine. So you can snap a photo of your tag number, place it in there. So if your car is stolen, that deputy they can push that information to the car, and he has that tag or she has that tag number right away. So as they're coming in, they may spot that vehicle or that missing person. So it's a it's a really good it's a really good tool. That's my that's my contact information. Um, I know that was short and sweet, but if you have any specific questions I, I, as long as you let me I'll answer <laughs> really quickly. thank you so much Tom um, Tom will take a QA and a um, at this point related to what he's just presented I'm gonna go really quickly to the next slide give me one second no no oh you did there it is sorry all right Stephen if you can put me into the um, the next slide please Thank you. So for the folks on the webinar, we have just turned on the comments portion of our presentation. So if you are on by webinar, you can get to the questions box in two different manners. If you're on a desktop version, you'll be looking at the photo that's on the right hand side. If you're on mobile or app or I believe tablet, you should see the option on the left. But there's a couple different ways to get to it. So the questions button has just been turned on. So those folks in the webinar can also ask questions of Tom as well. So we will um, keep this screen screen up and um, move, move to the Q&A uh, portion for Tom. Does anybody have questions for Tom related to hurricane preparedness, hurricane safety? No questions? Okay, absolutely. We'll bring the microphone to you right there. And then Tom, if you want to address it. Just a simple thing. How do you access a smart 911? How do you get to it? Oh, sorry, yeah, it's uh, smart911.org. <clears throat> And it's, it's pretty simple to set up. It, it walks you through step by step. Other questions? David, if you want to grab the mic here. Thanks for the presentation. 
Um, you touched on hurricane winds, and then you briefly touched on the storm surge. surge. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about storm surge and what you really think might be the biggest problem on this island from a storage surge perspective? Well, I'll, I'll say for, for example, for Matthew is, you know, we're very fortunate. We've got a solid beach and a, uh, at, at the time of Matthew had a solid dune system. So the dunes and the beach really helped us out a whole lot with storm surge. And really with storm surge, it just depends on the storm. You know, obviously, you know, you're at some of the lowest points on the island here. So you're, you're probably going to get from a, an eight or a 10 foot storm surge, you're going to have water in, into homes most likely. For Matthew, we had a uh, six foot storm surge and very fortunately didn't have any homes with salt water inundation. So that, that's a good thing and the dunes held, but anything over six foot, we really need to be concerned or really need to pay attention. That's, and that's some of the key for evacuation is why you guys need to get, get out of here. So, because that storm surge is, is, is a large concern. So really it's just a matter of elevation and what that storm is bringing us. Does that answer your question or am I? Yeah. There's a, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. To go, there's a flyer for Smart 911 in the, in the bag, and the website's on there as well. Thank you, sorry. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. So, again, all the information that Tom has. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Just so you guys can have it, we will also be sending out the new version that Tom has just shown of the emergency preparedness booklet since they just got that hot off the press. So we'll be sending that out digitally via our email. We'll also post the updated version on our website, submit additional information about SMART 911, how to register for Nixle if you haven't had a chance to do that. We'll also share the links to uh, the Sheriff's Department Facebook page, the County's Facebook page, as well as the Town's Facebook page. And again, in the event of an emergency or an evacuation, CSA works directly with the town of Hilton Head and Beaufort County Sheriff's Department. We pass information through a number of different sources. Um, certainly our Facebook page, cpineslivingcom um, excuse me, our website, cpineslivingcom our Facebook page, Facebook uh, com backslash Cpines Living, and then also our mass email communication system. So if for some reason you're not signed up via mass email, please send us your email information at info at csacpines.com and we'll be happy to get you registered. So we will move now to uh, information related to alligator and wildlife safety. David Henderson, our Director of Special Projects and Operations, will be leading us off. Toby McSwain, our Director of um, Safety, Security, and Transportation, will be assisting, as well as myself. So I'll hand it over to David. David. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda, and good morning to everyone. I'd like to start by echoing Brett's condolences that he passed on earlier to the family and friends of, uh, of Mrs. Klein. Um, it was, as Brett mentioned, almost two and a half weeks ago that the incident occurred. And you know, I was in the office, it's that time of year, discussing budgets, and the report came in. You know, details were not immediately known when the call came in, but you know, my reaction to was to get some equipment out of my office and, and to respond along with maintenance and security. And it was a short drive to the incident scene from the office. And you know, during, during that short drive, you know, I had a, a, a variety of thoughts going through my mind that, that ranged between you know, shock and, and disbelief and everything in between. I, I recall during that drive thinking that, you know, if this was some kind of sick prank, I hope they found out, you know, who it was that, that made the report. But we all arrived at the scene, and it, it, it immediately became clear that it, that it wasn't a prank. Uh, we ID'd the gator that we believed to be responsible. We captured it. We euthanized it. And we turned it over to South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, who had also responded to the scene. During my 20 years of service here in Sea Pines, I've experienced many good things and a few bad things. Um, I can recall accidents and, and incidents, and some of you may remember these. They go back some years, some of them. And we've, in the 20 years I've been here, we've had two people in Sea Pines that have been struck and killed by lightning. Uh, in 2009, Sea Pines Security Officer Stephen Newell was driving into work and was killed when he struck an alligator and lost control of his vehicle. 
you know, these exceptionally rare tragic occurrences you know, challenge us to find a way to weave them in to our life experience. And the loss of Mrs. Klein in this specific incident has been you know, especially hard for me to process. The, the specific circumstances behind her, uh, her event uh, you know, produce an innate, innate visceral reaction that have likely been with, with humanity for, for millennia. You know, as a father of two children, uh, including a 10-year-old boy who lives to capture, identify, and release all things that swim, crawl, and slither, uh, you know, I struggle to even contemplate, you know, a similar situation, no matter how unlikely it is to occur. But when we're confronted with an incident such as this, we, we want to know what, what can we do to reduce the risk going forward. With regard to alligators, we have and will continue to permanently remove nuisance alligators as allowed by a permit from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. When I started working for CSA in 1998, there was already a program in place to remove nuisance alligators. At that time, it was via uh, regional trappers that were authorized by uh, South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. In 2005, South Carolina DNR began directly issuing permits to communities, to CSA. And since that time, we have permanently removed 85 alligators since 2005 that were evaluated and deemed to be exhibiting aggressive or nuisance behavior. Sea Pines founder Charles Frazier intended for residents, guests, and visitors to live and enjoy our exceptional low country environment, including alligators. We need everyone to be aware and vigilant of their surroundings. We post signs, we distribute information on our website and various community you know, publications. Earlier this year, Sea Pines began participating in a Clemson University alligator behavior and movement study. One of the key objectives was to learn how to minimize interactions between humans and alligators in order both to keep our residents and our ecosystems safe. Gross observations of location data that has been received to date reinforces known but important aspects of normal alligator behavior. First of all, alligators spend a lot of time at the water's edge. We also know through data that we're receiving that alligators in sea pines move throughout their environment. They move into, out of, and within sea pines. So do not assume the alligator that is in the lagoon near your home today is the same alligator that was there last week or an alligator that may be there the following week. So to summarize my comments, this is an exceptionally rare, tragic occurrence that has affected all of us. CSA has and will continue to directly manage our alligator population in a way that is consistent with SCDNR requirements. We will continue to work with all members of our community on wildlife awareness and vigilance, and if we can find a better way to do something, we will do it. In conclusion, Sea Pines is a wonderful place to live, to work, and to visit. And we want to do everything that we can to make sure that everyone is safe while doing so. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our Director of Safety and Security, Toby McSwain, and uh, I, I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, just to follow up a little bit what uh, David spoke about, um, we are reviewing our policies and procedures as it relates to uh, animal removal. Uh, we are doing this in connection with uh, South Carolina DNR uh, as well as uh, Florida DNR because I think kind of think they're really considered the duty experts when, it, when especially when it deals with alligator removal. Um, 
we want to make sure that if you if you see something, we want you to say something. Uh, we have a wildlife officer uh, full time where we are adding a second officer to our program. Um, it's a little tough. Um, I know David participates, myself as well. Uh, when, when we're removing, especially a, a large alligator, it is definitely not a one-man operation. So we are adding a, a second wildlife officer. Um, when you make a report of a nuisance, we're, we're going to do an evaluation. And uh, this one, we're not, we're not turning a blind eye. You call regardless of the time of night. It may not be the wildlife officer that shows up in the evening, but it's going to be someone from the security department that's going to assess what is taking place. Um, we're, there's been a lot of talk in Facebook, and I want to hopefully clear some things up. And David mentioned it. We're, we're not in the process of killing all the alligators in sea ponds. That's not possible. One, we don't even know how many alligators we currently have in sea ponds. Uh, but we are going to evaluate that. Um, because an alligator is laying outside your back deck sunning itself doesn't mean that it's probably going to be removed. We, are, we do want to do an evaluation to determine is the animal a threat to humans. Um, we're not going by a policy. There is, no, there is no state policy. Just to let you know, there is not a state policy that talks about this is a nuisance re removal program for the state of South Carolina because it doesn't exist. DNR gives us the permit. We make the decision whether or not the alligator is a nuisance or a threat to, to human. Um, everybody's familiar with sea pines. Our, our waterways, our leisure paths are in very close proximity uh, to a lot of lagoons. You've got to be careful got to be careful. You got to keep your pets on a leash. Don't let them swim in the water. If you've got a lab that loves to play in the water, sea pines, no waterway inside of sea pines is safe for a dog to swim in the water, especially a human. Small children, you got to keep an eye on. Um, we are putting up signage. Uh, David, if you will take and hold that sign up for me. Now, I, I understand that the signs that we're employing today are not the most attractive signs. Please don't steal our signs. Um, we, we have had property owners that I under, understand it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bright sign. We want the people to see the sign. That's the whole purpose of the sign. So to go and put something brown that says beware of alligators, is not, we're not accomplishing anything with that. This is what we're putting up. Uh, we have put signs up that the property owners don't want to look out their back door and see, and they remove the sign. So we're calling the sheriff to let you know that you stole our stuff. Just want to let you know that. So please do not, do not remove our signs. We're actually going to the point of putting the poles in the lagoon. So if you're going to remove it, you got to swim out to it. <laughs> so please, we, that is a state official DNR alligator sign. We took that, their template, and we put our information. So when you see the telephone numbers, it rings at our office so that we can respond. So please. Uh, as the old signs become deteriorated, we're replacing this. This is what the new signs. There's a lot of waterways. Uh, how many? We've, I think we have 20 signs remaining in our inventory, and we're, we are going to order more. But there's a lot of waterways in here to put signs as, and not every place is where you walk out where you're going to come in contact with the water is there going to be a sign. But we are trying to put them in the heavily trafficked areas so that people realize when they come here, we have alligators in all of our waterways. But if you have an issue going on, please report it. Uh, we're going to document it. Uh, we are working uh, to develop to see is there something else out there when it comes to this type of, of, of nuisance that we deal with. Are we employing all that we have available to us uh, to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can? Currently, and I want to understand that I've already got asked about this this morning. Right now we have eight alligators we are trying to locate and remove. Not re not relocate to the forest preserve, we're looking to, we're looking to destroy the animal. If you have a nuisance alligator, and David and I have had this conversation quite a bit, I think the alligators know what uniforms we wear. Because when we show up, they swim out to the middle of the pond. Uh, so we have uh, eight right now that we're currently, that we've had issues with. We observe uh, actions of the animal. The, it has to be removed. So when you see Chris out there, 
please let them do their job. There's going to be two of them now. We bought some additional equipment. So we, we have eight that we're currently actively removing. So I understand that you filed the complaint. <laughs> and it's, this is not an easy task, I can assure you that. And please, by all means, do not attempt to remove the alligator yourself. That is against the law. You have to have the permit that's been issued to us in order to do that. Okay? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Amanda Sutcliffe-Jones. I'm the CSA Director of Communication. I appreciate David and Toby making comment on uh, the alligator and wildlife safety information. I did want to expand on it just a bit. So as you know, Sea Pines is home to lots of critters and creatures, not just alligators. Um, we have animals such as birds, sharks, snakes, deers, coyotes, and many, many other species. Some of those animals can hurt you. So what we um, are looking to expand upon is the wildlife safety campaign in Sea Pines to make not only our property owners who live in the community, uh, but also our visitors, guests, commercial contractors, et cetera, are more aware of what we have in our area, not just in Sea Pines, but the low country of South Carolina in general. The campaign will focus around stressing the awareness uh, and vigilance of our low country surroundings. It will also have a call to action to be aware of your surroundings, but also be um, aware of the safety of others around you. So if you see something like a, a visitor, you know, potentially taking pictures of an alligator near a lagoon, which we have um, happen occasionally, please call us. That's something that we need to dispatch an officer to so we can assist with the situation. Toby made mention of our Sea Pine Security Dispatch line. Um, that number is 843. 671-7170. That is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week phone number. Um, if you see anything that you think is uh, of suspect, see something, say something please, so we can dispatch an officer. Uh, again, we have put out information related to uh, an informational bulletin related to sea pines alligators or alligators in sea pines. It's available on our website and was distributed via mass email. We're working to get this to the rental management agencies, working to get it to our commercial contractors who are in sea pines as well, and the other uh, folks that I made mention of. We will continue to expand upon this and um, talk about the other animals that are in our community as well so we can, we can all stay aware. So thank you to Toby and to uh, David for that information. Again, like I mentioned, that information is on our website at seapinesliving.com, and Toby did cover some of the precautionary measurements that you can take uh, related to alligators in our community. I will now pass it back to Toby, who will come back up for some safety and security department updates. We'll take questions afterwards um, at the Q&A session once we turn on the webinar, but thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, just a couple uh, security updates. Um, following back, um, to mentioned something that Tom uh, was talking about getting information out their Facebook, their Twitter page. When we evacuate at Sea Pine Security, C Pine, um, the town of Hilton Heads EOC assigns someone to Sea Pines. So I have a direct contact. So they're constantly calling me. Uh, through both storms, uh, okay, what's going on? What are you guys working on? So when we have downed trees, all the inf information and issues that we're dealing with in sea pines, I report back to the town of Hilton Head that gets logged in. Uh, with our photos, he mentioned on the Facebook page, what we're doing, and we did this with Irma, staff that would take photos, we would just shove them to the town, and the town would post them up. So instead of us trying to send everything to Amanda to send out to put photos. Our photos are going to the town EOC so that you can see if, if you looked back at Irma when we came in at, at the CSA building there by Six Oaks was underwater. I took a bunch of pictures. I shoved them off of the town saying, hey, this is the road that's flooded. So we were just reporting all that. So the town is going to be a very good source. So I mean, not say not don't go look at the county's website or their Facebook page because there is information there. But the town, where everything that we have, I have a point of contact that I deal with. I send all that information of what we're doing in Sea Pines to that EOC desk. So I just wanted to follow up with that. Uh, next month, I will give you an update on the ABDI. Uh, it's the software program that uh, CSAs we've signed a contract. And it's, it's in process is what I can tell you right now. And hopefully next month we'll have a, a better update and kind of have a phase, hopefully a phase system laid out of what's going to transpire over, hopefully over the next year. Um, 
Although the year is not over, uh, our rental season that we consider, the trolleys have stopped running uh, as of Labor Day. Um, it's, been, it's been active this, this summer. <laughs> um, uh, it's not, not been the worst summer that we've had. We, we have responded to a lot of calls, but we, didn't, we have not set any records. Um, the activated alarms that, that I've talked about for a, for a number of years, uh, I do appreciate the, the response from the community, especially if you have an alarm that is malfunctioning. Those calls of, of alarms that are malfunctioning that we're just responding to constantly three and four times a night, we're not, we're not going to those as quite as often. Um, breaking and entering to motor vehicles. Uh, we listed as a breaking and entering. Most of the motor vehicles that have been entered has been left unlocked. So it was basically people pulling on door handles and taking uh, whatever items that, that's and it's been property owners vehicles as well as guests vehicles uh, Just removing items from inside the car. So they're just pulling on door handles So even if you're coming home and you're only there for a short time You're going back out lock your door car doors and your driveways especially overnight um, Fireworks we didn't you know normally every summer especially those of you who live beach side we get a number of calls um, the beach patrol started trying to was it June? Okay, we bought a beach vehicle. Uh, you may, if you've been out on the beach uh, this year, probably seen one of the security staff riding up and down the beach. Uh, we are purchasing a second vehicle in next year's budget. Uh, so we, we were out. I don't, we didn't have that many uh, fireworks calls this year. What we did realize that we soon become um, overwhelmed with was the number of beach chairs. I'm just gonna say miscellaneous crap. <laughs> that people have left on the beach. I mean, I, I actually think people show up here on vacation, they buy a tent and the beach chairs, and they show up the day that they're going to the beach, and they leave them there, and they, they leave and go back to wherever they're from and just leave it on the beach. Because behind our office is full of tents and chairs that we've collected off of the beach. And we really have pushed this information out, uh, especially during turtle season, when you can see the tracks of, of a turtle that goes, walks through the middle of a tent that someone's left on the beach. So we tagged a bunch of, of, of stuff this year. We are working with the town to try to come up with a process because the beach vehicle we have would not hold. I actually need a pickup truck for the beach to pick all this stuff up. But people just, they just leave stuff out on the beach. And it's ridiculous, it really is. Um, so that was an, an issue that we dealt with. The parking complaints, I mean, I, I actually think we're always going to have parking issues. I mean, it was, we had a number of calls, but it's nowhere near the, that what we've dealt with in the past. Our motor vehicle collisions, we, year to date, as of uh, three days ago, we've had 74 uh, motor vehicle collisions this year. Uh, last year, just to let you know, we had 111 total last year. Um, um, combined for the entire year. So the motor vehicle collisions uh, are down. Noise complaints are down as well. Uh, so it, all in all, it was a, a fairly, I mean, it was busy, but uh, it was not anything that we we've had not dealt with in the past. And our wildlife calls uh, are in the process of obviously going up. Uh, we've had 499 actual wildlife calls uh, year to date this year. Um, so please, um, be vigilant, call if, if you see something. Even, and I, I'll, I say this all the time, that people tell me, well, I, you know, I saw this going on, and I didn't call. We, we, ha we always have something to do. But if, there, if it looks strange to you, and it turns out to be nothing, last night, at 9 o'clock last night, we had, we responded because a property owner, I'm glad they called, thought someone was stealing stuff out of a house because they were loading a pickup truck up. Well, it's a demolition that's getting ready to take place. Well, one thing, they're not supposed to be working after 7 p.m. So we were there to be able to handle that, but they actually thought someone was breaking into the home removing stuff. Well, it turns out it is legit. They are tearing this house down, but they can't work at 9 o'clock at night. So if you see stuff like that, you need to report it. Let, even if it turns out we go out there and we waste gas and time and it turns out to be nothing, we, they're on a shift. They're being paid regardless. Let us run the call just to make sure uh, that it is what it's supposed to be. Okay, thank you so much.
Good morning. Just wanted to follow up quickly um, with uh, Brett's comments and David and Toby to express my condolences to the Klein family, their family, their friends, and their neighbors on Governor's Lane. It's certainly, uh, as David mentioned, it's really kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, <clears throat> that day I was working on this project in Greenwood Drive, trying pulling together our plans. I just wanted to give everyone a quick update this morning. Um, our project is currently out the bid. Um, we're awaiting the bids back from our contractors and working towards establishing a time frame for the work. Right now we're looking at uh, to potentially mobilize the week of September 17th. Um, I was in contact with our engineers and contractors this morning. And uh, as, I as I previously mentioned, uh, we're expecting this project to take approximately 12 to 15 weeks to complete. I know some of you might not have been at the August 14th community uh, meeting that we had here um, in Sea Pine Center. I would suggest that you go back and look at the video. I know it's a little challenging with the sound um, on the video, but again, if you were not able to make that meeting, we had a lot of details there about the Greenwood Drive construction, our traffic plan, and all the moving pieces of the Greenwood Drive. Um, it's certainly, as I said before, a, a very, very necessary project and one that has a lot of moving components uh, to it. Um, on, the, on the traffic plan, I expect there to be updates as we uh, move forward uh, in conversations with our contractors uh, for this project. So again, we're happy to take questions um, this, uh, this morning uh, when we go to the Q&A, but again, Greenwood Drive um, is, on, is uh, on target for a September start here, and again, the week of, we're looking at the week of 17th at this time uh, to mobilize. Sea Pines Timber Bridges, um, we've been working on this project as well uh, for quite some time, and right now we have an anticipated start date of September 10th. Um, this, this start date may move uh, depending on some final um, some final uh, uh, negotiation with our contractor on, a, on that start date. So again, we're working to mobilize on, on the 10th of September. And um, just a reminder on, on this project, we are building two new timber bridges adjacent uh, to Beach Walks 25 and uh, 26, and then also rebuilding the timber bridge that exists on the corner of Greenwood Drive and Sea Pines. Uh, we're, we're expecting that this work would take approximately three months to complete. Uh, so again, we'd, we'd be finished with this sometime before the holidays. Um, and these, these timber bridges will provide access to those beach walks at 25 and 26 and improve uh, safety at the intersection. Deer Island Bridge uh, repairs is something that we've been working on for quite some time. Um, we're in the process of ev evaluating the bids uh, from our contractors. Um, we're looking towards the fall to mobilize on this project to the beginning of October. Um, working through some final permits with the Army Corps engineers and uh, the state of South Carolina. And again, uh, th this project would take approximately three months as well to complete, um, but trying to, trying to finalize this start date. Um, with this, uh, there would be expected uh, lane closures of the bridge. Uh, the bridge would be narrowed down to one lane at a time. Uh, when we're in peak, con uh, peak construction or peak repairs. And uh, we will have a traffic plan for this that we'll share as we get closer uh, to the bridge uh, repairs that we'll be making. With, the, with these bridge repairs that we'll be making this fall, the bridge will have an expected 10-year life expect expectancy after we complete those repairs. Uh, so again, this is a much needed project uh, for sea ponds. Just a, a few other things to uh, mention. Now that the season is kind of hopefully slowing down, uh, we are going going to be executing quite a bit of uh, leisure trail repair on our leisure trails throughout Sea Pines. Uh, we also have some projects planned at Audubon Pond and Gold Point Road uh, to remove the uh, rotted uh, railroad ties and install some new landscaping and some curbing along those intersections. Uh, roadway uh, repairs, again, uh, this fall we have a bunch planned for uh, some of the secondary roads, and um, we'll be working on that right through the uh, through the holidays. 
our flower change out, the ever popular flower change out, is uh, on target for the uh, beginning of October, either the first or second week. So we'll get those notifications out, uh, as I'm sure our uh, summer dis flower displays uh, will be quite popular. And then our, our mosquito spring is ongoing uh, through the next few weeks into September, uh, late September, October, um, to keep on top of that mosquito population. So. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. So, hello once again. I will be covering our board of directors election information and some helpful upcoming event reminders. So we'll move right into board of directors. I'll be covering information for our ASPO and CSA board of director elections. The following positions are available commencing on January 1st, 2019 for CSA. We have three Class A director positions available for the board. We have uh, three director positions available as well for the Association of Sea Pines Plantation Property Owners. The CSA and ASPO nominating committee members are listed above. The ASPO nominating committee members include Charlie Miner, the chairman, David Borghese, and Richard Matthews for ASPO. The CSA nominating committee members include Charlie Miner, the chairman, David Borghese, Michael Tucker, and Mark Griffith as ex officio. Candidate by the nominating committee. So uh, you'll see on your screen the um, information was due by August 1st if uh, individual property owners were interested in running uh, through a application process through the nominating committee. They had to submit their information to uh, Sandra Archer, our executive administrative assistant, by August 1st, and that has been completed. The nominating committees interviewed those individuals and the nominating committees have made recommendation for each um, of their specific boards and the candidate names will appear next. Um, this information was posted on our website as well as posted through mass email and to our Facebook page as per the bylaws which were due by August 31st. We had to post this information. The following candidates have been selected by the ASPO nominating committee to run for the 2019 ASPO board. Barry Barth, incumbent. Paul Crunkleton is a new candidate. John Ferencoff, new candidate. Thomas McPhillips is a new candidate. Larry Moshvin is a new candidate. And Paula Scanlon is a new candidate. The following candidates have been selected by the CSA Class A nominating committee to run for the 2019 Class A residential board positions. They include Barry Barth, who is an incumbent, Paul Crunkleton, who is an incumbent, John Ferenkoff, a new candidate, David Hershkovitz, a new candidate, Thomas McPhillips, a new candidate, Larry Moshvin, a new candidate, and Richard Spear, who is also a new candidate. Some information on running by petition. In addition to those nominated by the CSA and ASPO nominating committees, persons may be nominated by petition. You can see the information for the petition process as, as follows. The information due um, by those interested in running by petition are due by October 1st, 2018. Nomination forms are available on our website at cpinesliving.com backslash 2018 election and they are also available at the CSA Administration Building. In addition to um, the information in the packet, we are also asking those folks who are running by nomination by petition to, in their packet, provide a brief biography and a statement on why they wish to serve the community and get that as part of their packet to Sandra Archer by email at sandra at csacpines.com by the October 1st deadline. If you have questions related to nomination by petition, you can contact us at 843-671-7810. The nominating committees of CSA and ASPO are seeking questions from the uh, property owners for questions to be asked of the board candidates. The committees will review those questions submitted by the community and select questions to ask of all the candidates. Each question, excuse me, each candidate will receive the same list of questions and be able to provide their answers, which we will post on our website, cpinesliving.com. In addition to that information, their biographies, their photography of the, um, the candidate, and their answers to why they wish to serve the community will also be posted on our website on or around October 12, 2018. 
Please submit your candidate questions to Sandra Archer, CSA Executive Administrative Assistant, by email at sandra at csacpines.com by Tuesday, September 18th at 4 p.m. So this is a request to the property owners. If you guys have questions that you'd like to ask of your candidates that will be running to, um, for the boards of ASPO and CSA, this is your means to do it. You can email us, uh, like I mentioned, at sandra at csacpines.com. Um, we ask that those submissions for questions be sent to us by September 18th at 4 p.m. This is just a, a reminder page of the information I've already covered. Again, August 1st was a deadline to submit an application to the nominating committee. October 1st is a deadline to nominate by petition. October 24th at 2 p.m. Um, in this room right here will be our Meet the Candidates forum. It, it will be available via Eventbrite, so if you're interested in a ticket, we'll be sending out information shortly to the community on how to register for a seat for the meetings. It's a very uh, well-attended meeting and we usually sell out. And we also will provide it via webinar like we are today as well if you're unavailable, um, unavailable or not able to attend. Again, November 1st, 2018, the ballots for CSA and ASPA will be mailed. And December 1st, 2018 is the due date for those ballots. They must be postmarked by December 1st. Some additional upcoming events. We have our ASPO board meeting here in this room on September 20th at 9 a.m. We have a community shredding event. It's going to be uh, set on September 24th from 9 to 12. That's a really popular event. We encourage you guys to attend. If you're going to, to be bringing items to the shredding event, please remove them from binders, but staples are permitted, so you can put that right into the shredding machine, and they'll get that taken care of for you. It'll be uh, out in front of the Sea Pines Community Center parking lot, so it's quite easy to get to. We have our CSA board meeting on September 25th at 3 p.m. Our next coffee for October is going to be held on the 3rd, but do note that in October we have an afternoon meeting versus a morning meeting, so it will be held at 5.30 in the afternoon for that meeting specifically. We are planning some community flu shots. Uh, it will be held on October 9th here in the center, um, the community center from 1 to 4. The number to call uh, to sign up is 1-877-582-2737. If you have Medicare, I believe it's no cost. Um, if you do not have Medicare, it's $35 cash or check. We're hosting a community blood drive as well on October 18th from 9 to 12 here at the Community Center. You can sign up for an appointment at cpinesliving.com backslash blood drive or you can walk in, whatever you prefer. Um, you'll see the next note here. Um, our annual yard sale that was planned for October 20th has been canceled. We did send information to that cancellation previous via email. Uh, because of the project planned for Greenwood Drive, Lot 1 and Lot 2 will be used as mobilization for that location, so we um, will have to cancel the yard sale due to that. Uh, we are looking um, with the Sea Pines Forest Preserve Advisory Board on potential dates, but haven't set a date um, yet. More information will be forthcoming if we are able to to reschedule, but at this point, the October 20th um, event has been canceled. I've already made mention on the Meet the Board at Candidates event on the 24th, and then again, keep it on your calendar, the bonfire is going to be held on November 9th from 4.30 to 7.30, and tickets for that go on sale in October. So again, um, for nomination by petition forms, they are on our website. You can go to cpinesliving.com backslash 2018 election to get that information. Those forms are due by by October 1st. At this point, I'll pass it over to Victoria, who will give us a financial department update. Victoria? You're welcome. And I'll get back there. I'm just going to That's fine. Yeah. Good morning. I wanted to just briefly talk about gate, gate revenue, gate passes. And last night when I was leaving work, I came out of the gate and I was first in line at the circle. And I can't tell you how long it's been since that has happened. So the gates um, I'm talking about between January 1st to August 31st as, and 18 compared to 17. All, all passes sold at the gate, that includes your commercial passes, your daily passes, your bus passes, your bike paths, etc. We are up in revenue which would we anticipated that due to the, um, certainly the fee going from six to eight in August, as well as the commercial going to $10 in June of 2017. But we are down in the number of passes. We're down by about 30,000, excuse me, 13,000 passes. Um, 
what we sort of attribute that to is those first few months in 17 when we had all those contractors coming in here for Hurricane Matthew recovery. We obviously didn't have that in 18. And then finally, everybody's going to ask, okay, what happened in August? Did our volume go down? Just for the daily gate passes, these are your, your, your daily visitors, we sold 849 more passes from August 1st to August 31st in 2018. That's a revenue increase of over $71,000. Amazing. And I, I don't have the answer as to why there's more volume. It could be weather related. We just don't know. And finally, talking about money. Um, oh, and by the way, on the, the gate pass, I, we do put up charts and I update them quarterly and they are on cpinesliving.com. And also on cpinesliving.com is a, is a summary of the Hurricane Matthew special assessment and the expenditure spent to date. We have expended to date over $5 million. We have about $1.1 left over, but we have not touched the boardwalks, nor, and we're still waiting on results of a tree survey study to, to determine the long-term damage from Hurricane Matthew. Again, these are on Sea Pines Living. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, it's been about an hour, so let's take a five-minute break. We'll be right back here in five minutes and do Q&A. Right here, have the mics. So we'll start right there with Marie. Thank you. Hi, Joni Harris, 23 Old Military Road. Just curious, uh, maybe, Amanda, this is for you. Uh, how many potential candidates submitted their names but were not approved by the board to be on the official ballot? I do not have that information right in front of me. Um, do, Brett, do you have the number, Sandra? I don't think that we, I don't have the number right in front of me, but from what I understand, all that were interested in having a potential opportunity to run as a candidate have been recommended by both boards. Okay, good, because my next question was going to be, if some were not approved, where could we find documentation that says what the board is looking for you know, for potential candidates. Maybe right. there are things that they need to get but more active in prior to submitting their names. One, one thing, the, the nominating committee, not the board, right. uh, makes the nominations. And the nominating committee are compri is comprised of residential property owners for residential uh, uh, property owner board positions. So, and, uh, you know, right now, I, so my understanding from that process, going through it and documenting it with Sandra, is that they have made uh, recommendations of all that applied. Okay, you're welcome. Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary Kimball. I was surprised um, with the alligator instance that happened, which is right around the corner from my house. Even in the newspaper, no one mentioned that there is a, f a fine for um, feeding the alligators. Mm -hmm. And there are people on Wood Duck that I know who have seen children, you know, throwing marshmallows to the alligators. And you know, they're trying to get them to come out and take a picture. And I, you know, I tell them, why in the world wouldn't you have called security? And I think this is one of the main things we have to remind people of is that there is, isn't it a thousand dollar fine for feeding yes. an alligator? Yes. Well, I, it's funny that the newspaper never even mentioned that. I mean, that would, you know, strike a bell with most people and the tourists here. So I think we really have to, um, you know, tell our, residents here and our visitors um, that they cannot do this. And if you see children out there doing anything to call security. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's our, our, our mission is to get people more aware. And if you see something, say something, call us. I mean, even silly things. Yeah, you know, right. we see a lot of, I see a lot of silly stuff going on out there. And, you know, if we don't know about it, we can't respond, but we will respond to every call that comes in related to an alligator or someone feeding wildlife, uh, no matter where it is or, or, or what, who's doing that. I mean, we want to know so we can stop that behavior. Brett, we have a question from the sure. webinar. So a question from the webinar is from Peter Vero. Are lagoons throughout the community, excuse me, are lagoons throughout the island that have gates supposed to be drained before the storm, uh, before a storm? I believe that was a question that was for the hurricane um, okay. prep portion. My apologies, but if you can address related sure. to sea pines. Uh, we, ha we have some protocols 
that we operate under in sea pines. I can't speak to the to all of the other operations out there, but the sea pine stormwater system, which comprises our lagoon system, uh, pipes, all of those things, goes actually outside of the gates. We we uh, pick up some off of Palmetto Bay and some out of South Forest Beach as well that come through those. Those lagoons are lowered as we move through the process, and Russell could probably address more of it in detail about it, but we have some pr protocol and we take stages. It takes a while to do that, and it has to be done in conjunction with tides. So when we start to see something going on out there in the, in the uh, Atlantic, we'll start to look at those protocols and what we need to do, whether it's a tropical storm or a hurricane or just a, a weather system that might be coming in from uh, the Northeast or something along those lines. Karen Kinderman, Greenwood Forest. Relative to the September 14th um, information meeting about the Greenwood Road reconstruction, I'm still not clear. As I recall, it's a three-week projected period that the road will essentially be shut down for that mile and a half length from the gate to plantation. Right, right now the plan is from Club Course Drive, not, not the gate, but okay, from Club, so from Course, Club Drive Course Drive yes. to close it all the to uh, Governor's, to Governor's Road. Okay. Okay. So then, for instance, if you live in Carolina Place, they don't have a back entrance or anything, so there's going to be some way to allow them access and egress. And even your offices, right? The CSA oh, office? The, the, those issues are, are being addressed in our traffic plan. Regard, regarding Carolina Place, is probably the most difficult of all. Mm. Um, there will be some delineate delineation set up in the roadway to allow access to Carolina Place. Regarding the CSA office and beyond the plantation drive, it's actually outside the area that we're closing for the three three weeks. Okay. Um, the plan now is, oh, if right. we can, uh, from a budget perspective, is to do that work at night from Governor's Road to Plantation Drive in that stretch. As, Some, as you pass, pass presumably us. to get into Carolina Place, then you would come out of Governor's. That's correct. And then there'd be a way to make a left turn. That's correct. And drive on that's, something. That's correct. And then my other question related to the, the back gate. Um, we've mentioned at last meeting, and I think before that, has any cons further consideration been given to having two lanes to come in and some sort of temporary egress to go out? Yep. Our, our, en our engineer is in contact with the South Carolina DOT as we do not own the roadway outside the gate at that location. Any sort of traffic control will have to be approved by, by the South Carolina DOT. Um, but towards that end, we are looking to establish two lanes into Sea Pines. I'll see, we'll see where it goes and see how far we get, but that's, that's what we are working on, yes. Good. Thank you very much. My wife Susan and I'm Tommy Ballard. We just moved, or well, just bought in Stony Creek, so we're new. I don't understand. Uh, thank you. Um, what does an alligator have to do to be a nuisance? You know, because I'm Jones. sure you don't want us to call every time we see one. So, what are you looking for? So there are behaviors that alligators exhibit that are perfectly normal, okay? We talked a little bit about that earlier, uh, and Toby mentioned it as well. So it could be just its mere presence. It could be sunning. Um, but there is behavior that is, that is not normal and that, generally speaking, uh, puts alligators and people in, in close proximity. So specific criteria that are used when an evaluation is done is if the alligator is on land, the flight response or the distance that when the person that's performing the evaluation is able to get to. If the alligator is already in the water, how does it respond to a variety of uh, stimuli? One could be just walking up to the bank. Okay, occasionally you'll see a response where an alligator has been likely fed and has a response to associate a person being at the edge of that waterway as potential getting fed, and so they will come over. Uh, not so dramatic, uh, but also uh, 
to be evaluated would be additional stimuli. It could be simulated feeding. So the person that's producing the, uh, conducting the evaluation would act like they're throwing something in the water. Simulated fishing with a fishing rod, not actually fishing, but simulated fishing. And the alligator's response. So there are a variety of, of criteria. But to sum it up, if the alligator approaches uh, to uh, a very close distance to people, that is generally a, a, a significant source of concern. At the end of Stony Creek, uh -huh. yeah. That, and, but I mean, I saw, I think the same one twice. But mm -hmm. it didn't exhibit any behavior like that at all. Sure. Uh, just to summarize for the video, uh, so this was at the end of their road. They've they've seen an alligator, but it does not exhibit. And so, if you would ever see anything like that, that's something we want to know about. Thank you, David. Okay. Other questions in the back here, David. Back, second to the back row, or third to the back row. Does the new signage um, indicate that there's a thousand dollar fee for f feeding? Toby, if you want to hold that up, it does not have a dollar amount on there. I know there's at least one, if not two, references to feeding. So it says, so it's, it talks about do not, you know, ap approach, feed, or harass. It says it is unlawful to feed alligators. Uh, if that alligator loses its natural fear of humans, this can pose a danger to the public and ultimately result in the alligator's death. Remember, a fed gator is a dead gator. I know of two cases that have been where people have been cited in sea fines over the last three years, and they were both charged $1,000 at court. Um, just as a, a follow-up to that, for future for future communications, we will include that information. That not, obviously, um, it's helpful to know as property and more specifically to guests and visitors and commercial contractors and um, all the like. So that way, we make sure that people are aware. Um, and again, to David and to Toby's point, it is against the law, and they can be fined um, for for those actions. Okay, um, responders, come to the microphone. We've got your own webinar. Remember? Oh yes. See, you're reminding me, Rod. Thank one you. Other, one other comment as it relates to feeding. Um, that would include, you know, the kids throwing the peanut butter and jelly sandwich off the deck, that kind of stuff. But if, if you're a fisherman, please do not put your fishing remains back into the lagoon because we're dealing with one that we're actually looking to remove on South Sea Pines Drive now. That very incident has happened, whether it's a, a renter or a property owner. We go down and there's a pile of fish heads where people have been fishing and they just put them back in the lagoon. That's feeding an alligator. You're going to be charged with that. And we're, we're working a little more closely moving forward with DNR where they're coming to help us do the removals and investigate cases when we get these. So I can assure you, uh, you might get a warning from Sea Pine Security. They're not going to issue you a warning. They're going to scroach you a, a ticket. And, uh, and it's not cheap. Uh, so please, and if you rent your home, and you manage it yourself, please put something in your home to indicate that. That I mean, and the ones that we believe that we're after right now is an issue where someone has been feeding these alligators. Just one additional update. You know, we, we are adding a wildlife officer. One of the objectives of that wildlife op officer are not just responses to uh, calls, but education and to get out there in front of the property management companies, in front of other people who interact and come in, contractors who come to Sea Pines, possibly put some videos together for anybody we issue a fishing license to, uh, those kinds of things so that we can get more information out to more people uh, as we move forward. And we want that resource to be able to do that. One place that everyone sees um, the information is coming in the gate where you have the electronic sign. Mm -hmm. Do you post um, that there's a fine to feed the alligators? I haven't noticed it, but that would be a constant reminder to all the renters or vacationers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we utilize that sign for a variety of messages, and that's certainly a message that would be appropriate. You know, I, I, our objective is to stay away from alligators, not to find you. Stay away from them. You know, that's really our objective for everybody uh, and to be safe and to be diligent in your safety. And, you know, those 
getting into the details may not be able to be picked up, but certainly if we're having some sort of issue out there or we've got uh, some reports of people doing things, that would be a very appropriate uh, message to get out there, especially if we can't get a hold of them if they're doing something. Okay, uh, Linda. Sure. One more alligator question. Sure. And this is really more of a nuisance kind of question. Pardon? Oh, Linda Ferenkoff. Anyway. Uh, the... The problem I see with, with what Toby says, and I agree with it 100%, if you see something, say something. Uh, preferably you shouldn't say it yourself because I've tried that and that doesn't work very well. Um, <laughs> but th often what's going on is fleeting. So by the time you call security, the person has moved on or you don't have any idea where that person is going. When you see someone, as I did not too long ago, try to run over a great blue heron with a bike, um, you know, that, that person was gone. If you see someone crawling down the ba bank to take a picture of an alligator, by the time security comes, they're going to be gone. Um, I have often wondered how many of the people who fish in here actually have a license. Should you call about every person that you see fishing to say, you know, is this legitimate? Um, I, I'm just wondering about the, 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 I know that what you're saying is good, Toby, but how effective would it be? Because, you know, the, and especially if they're on the leisure trails. Uh, we do issue fishing permits. If you're fishing in a lagoon in Sea Pines, uh, outside of being a property owner, if you're, uh, you have to be a rental guest. Uh, we do sell the fishing permits at our office. We are adding a sticker to the back of the fishing permits as an indicator to say you got to be aware these are precautions that you have to use while fishing in Sea Pines. Uh, we're going to add the sticker, but we've always told people when when they come because we. Hey, look, when you get this, you've got to be aware that there are alligators in here. No, we don't, we don't want you to call if you see someone fishing. Um, I mean, because that's not, that's not an indicator that, okay, there's something, an interaction going on with an alligator. One thing that we, we are concerned with that we do monitor is here uh, right before the tournament, we had a father and son fishing. And one, that, one of the things that we do look at when someone is fishing is when they catch a fish, what does the alligator do? Father's on one side of the bank, and this kid that's eight years old is on the other side. And there's an alligator 20 feet away. So then we interact saying, look, you have to stand next to this, your kid because as soon as he drags that fish up, if that alligator comes out, now we have something we have to deal with. That is an indicator, okay, this alligator is going to have to be removed. But by the mere presence of someone fishing, that's not, I mean, because they're, I mean, they're, especially during the summertime, there's someone fishing every day, all day. Um, but, the, but if you see something of uh, tossing stuff in the water, uh, uh, definitely harassing the alligators, we definitely want to be notified. Of oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how you could identify them among the millions of people. We have but, locations you know, now that we're putting it, cameras in. To, several to, years yeah. ago, I saw young men going down to the lagoon via the leisure trail with a long pole, um, pool pole with a chicken tied to the end of it. And I think you can guess exactly what they were going to do, see no. if they could make him jump. Um, and, you know, by the, by the time I would have been able to call that in, you know, they, because the person I was with said, what are you going to do with that chicken, boys? And they said, nothing, and just kind of faded away. That's but, definitely a call we want to Yeah, you know, but yeah. that, that sort of thing does happen, especially spring break. Uh. <laughs> There's a lot of people here. There's a lot of guests, as you all know. I mean, every Saturday we get a brand-new batch. Uh, some, some people that they just don't know that they're, they're, they have no knowledge that there, there's alligators and that there's dangers here. We have others that are, are ignorant to the law that are going to do whatever they want and they think it's cool that every night, you know, the kids get to see the alligators come up and feed off the back deck. That's wrong. That's, and that's one of the issues, that's one of the major problems that we deal with with alligators. It's not because of the, the nature of the alligator, it's what the humans are doing to cause the interaction. That's what we're dealing with and that's what we want to, because we, we're, we're going to take a hard-nosed approach with this with DNR. We're inviting them in. They're coming to work with us, and they're going to write a ticket. If not, now let me make sure they understand. It's not in addition to a ticket. 
depending on the circumstances, they can put handcuffs on you and take you to jail. So I hope you understand that. So that, that is a, a possibility, feeding an alligator. Is there any thought to reduce to reducing some of the restrictions for adding fences to our yards to protect our pets? Well, that's generally an ARB issue. Uh, CSA doesn't step into that, but it's something that's been discussed. I've seen a lot of fences, especially around swimming pools, are, are going in if it's appropriate and it's designed correctly and allowed by the ARB, but that's a, a, a question for them and we don't have an ARB okay. representative here today, I don't think, do we? No. That's actually a very good, I'm glad you brought that up because it was in my notes that I did not mention. If you're a homeowner, and especially if you rent your home, and you have a swimming pool that is low to the grade in the back, and you have, regardless of you live on a lagoon or not, make sure, especially if you've got young kids prior to going out, that someone inspects that swimming pool, because I can't tell you how many times this summer we've taken the alligators out of the swimming pool. It's a body of water. They're, they're, they're in the water. That's just that's another attraction. They know the water's there. They're going to go to it. Make sure, because I've had a property owner that had, was, had their, and it's, it's frightening, but they had their two small grandkids. They'd been in the pool, came in for lunch, and normally they sling that sliding glass door open and out there and they're jumping in the pool. Well, thank goodness he went to the door first because there was a five foot alligator actually in the swimming pool. So you gotta inspect that and please put notes if you rent your home, regardless if you're on a lagoon or not, it is a body of water, because you will see alligators just walking middle of the forest preserve, down a fairway. There's no water around, but they know where they're going. And Russell's crew is cleaning drain pipes out, and it's like creating a new I-95 for the alligator. <laughs> uh, so please, so if you've got a pool, make sure you inspect it. And I think ARB is allowing fencing. I know of two that is going in this summer that we've had issues with that they're approving to have some type of fencing put in. Brett, we have a question from the webinar. Okay. then. Uh Let's do Christopher. Can I Go take ahead. it? Perfect. This question comes in from Ted Levitt. The question is, I'm assuming a referendum is still planned. Are CSA directors going to have an informational session to get feedback from property owners before putting out the ballots? Actually, we have a pretty long process that we anticipate going through for a referendum. Uh, I anticipate getting some direction at the next board meeting from the board on establishing uh, some of the criteria around that. Then we will be doing at least uh, several community meetings as well as videos, as well as uh, the plan cr currently is to do a survey to get feedback uh, from all community members as well. Thank you, Brett. Uh, Christopher Cliff, uh, whilst we're having this uh, discussion about alligators, um, we, we live on the eighth hole on the country club, and, and we regularly observe um, members and staff harassing the alligators. That lagoon has about three in there. Um, and not so long ago, in fact, the greenkeepers attacked the alligator uh, with their uh, ATV. Um, up and down on the bank, and I went across and said, um, spoke to him in Spanish, he said, hey guys, you know, th that's not the thing to do. I'm coming around to the question, the question is, what is the jurisdiction between uh, yourselves and the, and the club cause in relation to the alligator population in their lagoons? We, we're, uh, we do evaluations all over sea pines. Our jurisdiction for security is sea pines. Great. So if, if in future that I, I see this happening. Call us. Call again. Okay, Absolutely. That, that's great. Okay. And just on, based on that, we'll have a discussion with the superintendent. I, I'd be grateful if you would because it, was, it, it went on for several minutes and I actually went out there, as I say. And yeah, if you in, just shoot me something, on, if you have an approximate day, time, oh, I, that kind of thing would be I helpful. Do, I, I took some photographs, yeah. Occurred. Great, I'll do that, thank you. Great. Other questions? Okay, well thank you very much. Hopefully we get cool weather. Happy football season is here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>